Good morning. Coffee soon, so uh, stay, stay the course. Um, which type of animal do you think I am? <laughs> An elephant, yes. And uh, madam, are you reassured that I'm the expert and I've got a bigger one than you? Yes. <laughs> Good, so just to <coughs> my credentials. Now, why am I saying say no to innovation? This whole day is about innovation, the art of the possible, um, innovation in my world. Well, innovation in my world has been <coughs> core and central to everything I've ever done. And what I've learned is what works and what doesn't work. So my aim today is to give you a very quick <coughs> checklist of ways to ensure that your innovation projects actually deliver what you want them to and most importantly, what your customers want them to. So would that sound like something that would be valuable to you today? Would it? Yes. Yes, good. So there was a quote on the slide when I originally wrote it. It's gone now, so I can just make it up, which is great. But you all know that this is Steve Jobs, the kind of embodiment of innovation. And Steve Jobs said, and this is where I took my, my title from, knowing when to say no is as important as knowing when to say yes. That's true for companies and it's true for products. When Steve Jobs went back to Apple, it had lost its way. It was going backwards. He found that they were trying to create 700 products and develop them to market. And he said, we don't need seven. He said, we need four. And in fact, it was actually only two products with two specifications for each. And as you know, the rest is history. He refocused the company. They did make four products. They created products that people didn't even know they needed and then couldn't live without. And now it's the biggest company in the world. And Steve Jobs is the figurehead for innovation. But he knew when to say no. Now this looks a bit like a hoarding, an advertising hoarding for my company. Perhaps it actually looks like an advertising hoarding for Visit Britain. This is just some of the organisations that I've worked for. I've worked across three sectors, public, private, and third sector, in all sorts of organisations, large and small, over 25 years. I'm not 100, but uh, I have been doing this for 25 years. And the point is, I've learned what works. I've developed, delivered, instigated, facilitated customer experiences for something like, conservatively, 30 million paying customers, and the point is they were paying customers, they had a choice. So what I'm going to try and do today is just to sort of short circuit all the stuff about you know, vision and all the rest of it, and just tell you what I think works and what doesn't work and what to avoid. So I've got three eyes for you today, the three eyes of innovation, and just a clue, none of them is actually the word innovation. This is the three eyes, this is your checklist for your innovation project. So I thought we'd start with a definition. And uh, the definition of innovation that I found, it's very interesting, I found uh, a, a, a definition by a guy called Dr. Stephen Marinville. Um, he is uh, an expert in successful innovation. He works with companies all around the world. He's also blind, and as he says, I've got no eyesight, but I'm full of insight. So he too is focused on what works. The definition of innovation then, the application of better solutions that meet new requirements in articulated needs or existing market needs. Now, the word I'd like to pick out there is application because this is not about having great ideas, great visions, it's actually about the application, how we put it into practice. So, talking about initiative, the first of my three I's. So why do we innovate? I'm sorry this is so small. I, I, because this is kind of a TED-inspired speech, I had some idea that we have a massive screen that was as big as that wall. So this looked quite big on my laptop, so apologies. But I, will, I will kind of read them out, but I'll try not to sound as if I'm reading them out, if that's okay. So why do we innovate? Well, Tom Peters, who's one of my favourite business gurus, said, all innovation comes from pissed-off people. This is people who get fed up 
with poor service delivery, with inefficiency, with wasted resources, wasted energy. And they say, do you know what? I'm going to go out and do something different. I'm going to change the paradigm. I'm going to change the business model. Richard Branson is a great example of this. He goes into new markets for him and shakes them up, creates a new business model focused on customers, focused on people. However, there's another side to this. I call it initiative-itis. Just by a show of hands, could I ask who here thinks they might have some idea what initiative-itis is? Yes, sir. If you have so many new innovative ideas that you just become numb to them? Yes, they don't numb to them. them. Numb, numb to innovation. Well, hopefully you're not feeling numb about innovation just yet. Coffee is coming, as I said. But yes, initiative items is about initiatives that are handed down from on high, and it's just like we need to do something, so we're going to do it. We need to restructure, we need to change what we're doing, and people get fed up with it, don't they? Who here, by a show of hands, thinks that they might either be suffering from or have suffered from initiative itis at some point in the recent past? Quite a lot of you, well, there we go. So, let's think about the reason for innovating. Going back to the definition we just saw, new requirements, the markets change, customers are getting more sophisticated, or perhaps we need to do something different, something new, uh, perhaps we've got less money, so we have to do more with less. Existing needs, just the fact that what we're doing isn't working as well as it should, and we need to do it better. The third one, and this is the one I'd kind of be very wary of, bear in mind I'm an elephant, so I'm going to sort of tell you what to be aware of and wary of. By the way, Janet, you said, to me, or I think Alan said, there were no animals in Janet's presentation, but she did say she was going to exit perceived by a bear, so I think actually there was one there. Anyway, that's me being an elephant again. Yeah. Inarticulated needs. I think Steve Jobs again was the master of this, coming up with new products, new services that we didn't even know we needed. And as I said, and then suddenly we couldn't live without them. I would say it's very, very dangerous, and I know we've been told we must you know, take risks and be dangerous, but it's very, very dangerous to think that we are Steve Jobs or Richard Branson and we can come up with things that people didn't know they needed. Let's just focus for the purposes of what works on what we know we need to deliver or what people know they want from us. Is that fair? Cool, yes? The elephants are agreeing anyway. But then there's the other side to this, the dark side, what I call the unreason, the unreasoned initiatives. So, habits and culture. It's very interesting. I have worked in and with the public sector over many years, and I've seen a real change where it used to be kind of seen as monolithic and unchanging. Now it's almost become the habit that we just must change all the time. We must do all these new initiatives all the time. And so I would suggest that we need to just be open, have open eyes to the fact that are we doing this because actually there's a compelling reason to do it, or just because it's the habit that we, that we change things all the time? Second, what I call the GIAG syndrome, grass is always greener. We've got a department or a team that are performing well, the team are happy, everything's going well, customers seem to be happy, the KPIs are being met, and yet somebody says, yes, but surely we could do it better, somebody must be doing it better somewhere. So let's just change it. Again, question that, because if it's doing well, I know that there's, there's a maxim that says, if it ain't broke, don't, uh, don't fix it, but there's another one that's come along that's kind of more in vogue, which is if it ain't broke, break it. But I would say, well, if it ain't broke, really, do we need to break it? Maybe there's other things that we need to fix that are broken. And then this last one, I'm sure nobody in this room is guilty of this, but you may have come across it and it's what I call vanity. Big projects with big famous architects or big famous designers, all the contractors are really expensive and we end up with a big shiny new building or a new product, a new service, a new logo. And somebody high up in the organisation will get, or well, it might be a minister, Somebody will get a lot of kudos for this project because it sounds wonderful. 
and they might not even still be around. They'll get the kudos, but they might not even still be around when the project's actually in its delivery phase. So basically, the project has been done, not purely, but it's, the way it's been done has been influenced strongly by the fact that actually there's an end result that somebody high up wants, regardless of actually whether it delivers what people lower down or at the front line or the customer actually needs. So you can't always determine whether your project is reasoned or unreasoned. I get that. You know, things are handed down, as we've said. But just have your eyes open. If you follow the next two of my three eyes, you should be able to at least mitigate some of the downsides of an unreasoned initiative. Are you with me so far? Cool. So the second of my three eyes is intelligence. I love this quote by Thomas Edison. The three great essentials to achieve anything worthwhile are First, hard work. Second, stick to itiveness. And third, common sense. Now we had an itis just now, initiative itis. That's not a good thing. Now we've got an itiveness, which is a good thing. Stick to itiveness. Be determined. Be committed. Be focused, like Steve Jobs. Drive through past all the obstacles. But I would say to you that only works if it's harnessed the third one, common sense. So when I talk about intelligence, the first thing I'm talking about is common sense. Do you know that syndrome where lots of intelligent people sit around a table and make seemingly crazy decisions? Totally unrealistic? Just mad? Does, has anyone ever come across that syndrome by a show of hands? Yes, but a few of you, surprisingly enough. There we go. So, do make sure, first of all, use intelligence, use common sense, and use experience. Again, very often people decide, right, we're going to do an innovation, we're going to do something new. They may not know anything about the field into which they're going or the process that they're adopting, but that doesn't stop them, they just go ahead anyway. And then there might be somebody in the team or somebody sort of close to the front line who does know about this or who at least could flag up the bear traps, but they're not involved because they might actually you know, cause too much trouble. Or if we don't have anybody anywhere in the organisation who knows about this stuff, who knows about this particular field that we're going into, find somebody who does. And I don't just mean bring a consultant on board. Obviously, I would like you to bring a consultant on board, but if you bring a consultant on board, bring them on board because they have real-world experience of doing this. Not just because they can write a strategy, and give you a report because they have done it in the real world. Now, who do we know like that? Anyway, so the second part of intelligence is data. Do your market research. Who are the competitors? What are customers wanting? Who else is doing this? Use benchmarking. One of the points that I would really like you to take away is when you do your benchmarking, so who has already done this? Don't reinvent the wheel if somebody's already worked out the solutions to your problems. But sometimes you might need to break the innovation down into its component parts and find benchmarks from all different sectors and then apply those. I mean, customer service is a particular one. Uh, when I worked for the National Trust for Scotland, we scoured the world to find a customer service programme that wasn't from Disney because the organisation said, they're not Disney, we've got nothing in common with them. But we ended up going to Disney because Disney do it best. So find who does each component of your innovation best and model off there, as Nigel said. And collaboration, incredibly important. Get departments, get people to share best practice. Nobody gains from people keeping best practice close to their chest because they're afraid someone else will get an advantage or get kudos. Share as much as possible and focus on the customer. I saw the art of the possible video and I thought it was great that you're talking to customers. That's really fantastic. So you'll know what I mean by the service profit chain. Who's familiar with that expression? Okay, service profit chain. I'm going to show you a quick diagram, but I'm going to just suggest that you Google it. Service profit chain. It's bottom up. It's customer focused. It's collaborative. All the things I've just said. 
The point about the customer service, uh, sorry, the service profit chain is expressed in eight words. Happy teams serving happy customers equals happy you. You being the project sponsor or the project manager or the stakeholder. Happy teams, so involvement of the people who've actually got to deliver it all the way through. Do Google service profit chain. And we come to the third eye of my three eyes of innovation, implementation. I love this quote, sorry it's slightly sexist, but it's from the early 90s. It's from the managing director at the time of McKinsey, one of the world's most respected consulting firms. I kind of feel I'd like to do it in a Southern American accent, but I'm not going to, because I'm relevant. Never forget implementation, boys and girls. In our work, it's what I call the last 98% of the client puzzle. That's very powerful, isn't it? It's the last 98%. The idea is just the start of it. It's not the end of it. So, implementation. Why are we doing it? That's where the big idea, the vision, generates the strategic objectives. What will be different when we've done this? And as was said earlier, it's got to be clear to everybody. It's got to be clear to everybody in the organisation who's got to deliver this, what we're trying to achieve. Because there's nothing that disengages people more than being asked to do new things when they don't know why they're being asked to do them. Would you agree? Yeah, that's where initiative ITIS comes from. Then there's the how. So you might be interested, I start with values. I think your values, which we've talked about, collaborative, customer focused, modelling off the best, inform the way you go about this, and transparent, sharing, and that informs your strategy, what you're going to do, and your process, how you're going to do it. And then the what. Planning should be focused on the outcomes and the specific measurable outcomes, the KPIs. And if it's not, then at some point your idea will bite the dust. You must be clear what specifically, as well as generally, will be different and how that is going to happen. And you need a review process that enables both people to feel free to express concerns, problems, issues, challenges. I would suggest that if you follow the three eyes that I've set out here, you won't have any sort of incredibly shocking revelations about stuff not working, but you will inevitably have glitches and problems along the way. And you need people to feel absolutely free to come forward with them because it's about continuous improvement. So, you'll see the sun is now shining. This is actually the top of the Cairngorm Mountain. I do a whole programme about leadership and how it's very lonely and how when you can't see you know, the landmarks, the, the milestones, you need your leader's compass. That's a different programme. But you'll see now the sun has come out because we've got our three eyes of innovation. Initiative. Be clear whether you're doing an initiative for reasoned or unreasoned purposes. And if it's unreasoned, can you do anything about it? Can you say, actually, we're doing this for the wrong reasons? Or can you just mitigate the kind of symptoms of an unreasoned initiative which is all about strategic vision and logos and designers but not about on the ground results for customers. Oh, sorry. Uh, second, intelligence. Always, always, always apply intelligence to all intelligent people. Don't go into a room and let intelligence fly out of the door. Apply common sense, apply experience, use the service profit chain to involve the deliverers and they will then deliver, the customer will be happy, and you'll be successful. And finally, implementation, it's the last 98%. It's not an afterthought. So make sure you give it that amount of time and attention. And if I haven't convinced you, remember this. History is filled with brilliant people who wanted to fix things and just made them worse. Don't let it be you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed.